I'd put something together on the Irish. And initially it was going to be the Irish in America. But I don't think you want to be here for the next two weeks. <laughs> then I got it down to the Irish in New England. No, I don't think you want to be here for the next two days. I got it down to Boston. Now Boston is perfect because Boston was one of the points of entry. Boston, New York, Philadelphia. I was shocked to find out how the Irish got here, how they were treated, and how they overcame all that. Contrary to popular belief, the Irish were not the first in Boston. It was the Puritans. And they came uh, in 1630. Now, when I went to public school, I don't know if you've had this experience. You, you get the short and dirty. You don't get deep. And as a history teacher, I, I know that. Um, when I learned about Puritans, um, I just learned they came here from England seeking religious freedom. And that was it. I, from who, what, I don't know. Why are they called Puritans? This is why they're called Puritans. This is the beginning. Henry VIII. Did you know that Henry VIII was a staunch Catholic? He even wrote a book promoting the Catholic Church against Lutheranism. Until he needed to get an annulment. And then he went and he basically said, I'm going to take my ball and go home. He confiscated all the church property, all the monasteries, and essentially turned it into the Church of Henry VIII, otherwise known as the Anglican Church, the uh, Church of England, and made himself the Pope. The thing is, that's about all that was changed. If you go into an Anglican church even today, you think you're in a Catholic church. Now, this is where the Puritans come in. They didn't follow Henry VIII. They didn't follow Martin Luther. They followed this guy. This is John Calvin. And John Calvin had a different kind of theology. His theology was that in order to be a pure Christian, you had to go back to the way they were in the first century, those early Christians. And you don't do anything unless it's written in the Bible. He said all those papal bulls, all those conclave decisions, uh, all those things, throw them out the window. They don't count. Those are decisions made by men. They didn't even celebrate Christmas because nowhere in the Bible does it say December 25th is the birth of Jesus. And, and I know they, they knew that when they made Christmas. So what they wanted to do, there were these English that followed Calvin, and they wanted to purify the Anglican church of anything Catholic. They wanted to take out all the, all the smackings of popery, as they called it. They thought the pope was the antichrist. So they removed everything Catholic. And when we talk about the Irish and Catholicism, they're intertwined like this when we're talking about Boston. So when I talk about Catholic, I'm talking about the Irish. This is uh, the ship's church in England, which was a Puritan church. Do you see any um, chalices, any tabernacle, golden tabernacle, big altar? It's totally devoid of anything Catholic. They were stripped down to the bare bones. Their ministers just wore black. They didn't wear all the purple and the green and all that stuff. And they hated Catholics, the Puritans. They thought they were evil. Oh. And they came in a fleet of 30 ships, these Puritans. They first landed in Salem. They spent a little time in Charlestown, but there wasn't enough water. So they bounced over to this place. This was called Shawmut by the Indians, what we know as uh, Boston. Now, they wanted to create this city on a hill, this shiny example of Christianity on this place called Shawmut. And they wanted to show the world what it was to be Christian. And here it is. Today it's called Boston. Uh, it was a peninsula that stuck out like you see there. At high tide, it was an island. <clears throat> and this is where it was going to be. And if you can think about it, after a few years, they constructed some buildings. And this is probably what that little village looked like that would eventually be the city of Boston. Now. If you look in the background, do you know what that hill is? Beacon, Beacon Hill. It's pre pretty good to, uh, 
there's a beak in there. That's how you tell them. <laughs> so if you can imagine standing in Boston right now, uh, if you know where the old state house is, and you turn yourself towards the new state house, you can't see it, of course. That would be that, that's the vantage point that you're looking at now. Right now, there'd be all these skyscrapers in the way and everything. But this is where they were going to do it. And, and they live by biblical law. The book of Leviticus. Has anyone read the book of Leviticus? Yeah. Oh. And they, they tried to enforce that kind of law, too. And into this, into this came the Irish. And they didn't come of their own volition. They did not come willingly. Now, here's another thing. When I went to public school, I learned an indentured servant is somebody that wants to come here, doesn't have the funds, contact somebody over here, and they f form an agreement. They sign a contract, an indenture, which says, you will come here after I paid your passage, and you will serve me for five to seven years, and then you're, you're free to go. Now, when you sign something like this, Normally, you would learn a trade. Uh, you'd probably get a suit of clothes and some money at the fifth or seventh year, and you're gone. Now, the Irish were brought over as so-called indentured servants, but not willingly. They did not want to come here. And let me tell you the story of how this happened. <coughs> it happened because of this man. Now, I mentioned the Puritans. The Puritans in England eventually got so strong that they started to challenge the establishment, the Anglicans and the Royalists. And there was a civil war, actually three civil wars. In the last one, the Puritans won. They took over England, and the king lost his head, literally. He was, he was put to death. Charles I put to death. And this man was put in charge. Now they said to him, do you want to be called the king of England? And he said, no. I want to be known as the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. Being very democratic, I guess, as it were. He was the general of the New Model Army, the Puritan Army, that had crushed the royal, Royalists. And he was put in place as the leader of England. Now, as soon as he took over, as soon as he took over, he started hearing rumors and murmurings from Ireland. There was a rebellion going on in Ireland. I guess they were taking advantage of the Civil War. Uh, England had been involved in subjugating Ireland going back to all, almost William the Conqueror. So this was another one of many uprisings. But this time, all the Cromwells hearing stor uh, stories of atrocities being committed on English landlords. They're being captured. They're being um, dismembered. There was the stories of cannibalism all these horrible things. None of it was true. It was just a regular uprising. I guess the original fake news here. Mm -hmm. But he believed it. He thought, these horrible Irish are tearing our people over, apart over there. I've got to do something about it. And he did. He took his new model army after they just defeated the royalists and pointed them towards Ireland. And here's what happened. He landed and marched right to the medieval walled city of Drogheda. And in Drogheda, his army surrounded the city. And the mayor came out on the walls. And he told the mayor, he said, you give up your city now. And the mayor, in so many words, told him where to go. Then Cromwell said, OK, you want it that way? We're going we're to play hardball here. He didn't say that, but you know what I mean. He said, if, if my men have to breach that wall and one person dies going through there to get through that wall, to get into your city, there will be no quarter. And they literally waved the red flag. That means everyone's going to be killed. He went into that city. It was a long siege. Finally, they breached the wall. They got in, and they went on a murder spree. And the stories of them chasing down people into the corner alleys and murdering them. Now, the number you're looking at right now isn't the soldiers. That's the civilian number that was murdered and killed. Well, I guess the message got out. 
because the next place they went, the number went down. I guess they heard who was coming and got out of Dodge. And then finally, Ireland was on her knees again. There was no more rebellion. That was it. But I guess he didn't want to stop there. This is what happened. In the 1650s, Cromwell and his army plucked 100,000 children from their parents' arms and sold them into slavery, indentured servitude. West Indies, Virginia, and New England. If you got to Virginia or New England, you were lucky. If you ended up in the West Indies, you were probably working on a sugar plantation. The average lifespan in a sugar plantation was six months. The work was so brutal. And also, they just went around abducting people and sticking them on ships and sending them to the Americas. This is how the first Irish got to Boston. I've seen the correspondence between the Puritans here and the Puritans there. We've got a new lot coming in. Who do you want? Who needs some servants? And they'd say, this one's allotted to this family, this one's allotted to that family, so forth and so on. And they probably came ashore and got off the ship like this. You can imagine that, that scene. Okay, where are you going? We're going to put you with this family. And the funny thing is a lot of Irish, once they got here, got settled, they ran away. And this is interesting. These are two <coughs> runaway slave ads. There's one on the top and one on the bottom. And if you look at the one on the top, it's a Negro fellow. On the bottom, you have an Irishman. A lot of the times, there were both African-American slaves and indentured servants. A lot of the times, they'd help each other run away. They'd give assistance to each other. Once they got away, more often than not, it was the Negro fellow that got captured and brought back because he stuck out. Now, the Irish guy could blend into the population and maybe slip off as long as he didn't open his mouth and start speaking Gaelic. So this happened. Now, if you were caught, and you were caught, you'd be treated like this. Yes, the pillory and the stocks. Now, that doesn't look too bad. You might get a tan. It's a nice day out. You don't have to work. That, that's tame. What really happened was total and utter humiliation. It's humiliating enough just to be stuck in there. <clears throat> but if they found out that somebody's in the pillory or stocks today, the whole town would show up with every kind of offal and garbage, anything they could scrape out of the gutter, and harangue you and throw it at you for an entire day. Now that's humiliation. And a lot of these punishments were like, this is one too, if, if you uh, continued to escape, you'd be whipped at the cart's tail. This is where you're tied to the back of a cart, dragged around the city, and people can have a whack at you. It's kind of like the gauntlet. And a lot of these punishments happen here. This is the townhouse. It was a town meeting house, and on the bottom there was like an open air market. And you'll notice this is where it all took place. And I'm going to show you that location today. It might look familiar. Yeah. Mm. Right where the Boston Massacre happened is where all that happened. There's nothing up there about the Irish getting whipped or, well, it wasn't just Irish. It was anybody who was misbehaving, I guess. But this is the Boston that the Irish came to. Now, what about the Scots-Irish? Now, growing up as an Irish Catholic, I, I, I just thought these Scots-Irish were people that drank scotch. <laughs> no. The Scots were also followers of Calvin. They were, were Scottish that had converted to Presbyterianism. Presbyterianism is the same as Puritanism. They both follow Calvin. And what they were doing during the years that the Puritans held sway in England, they were taking Scots and trying to transplant them to colonize Ireland to push the Irish out, push the Irish Catholics out. So that's why you have a large number of Protestants in Northern Ireland. They all came from Scotland, and they were transplanted there. <clears throat> now, uh, 
After a while, the Puritans fell out of favor with the English. And they lost, they lost their power. I, I think it's because they were no fun. They didn't, they didn't allow bear baiting. They didn't, they didn't even celebrate Christmas. No, there were a lot of other reasons too. They were finally replaced. They brought back the royal family. Oh, Charles I is not around, so the next best thing was his son, Charles II. Now, the Puritans are on the outs. They're out of power in England. Back in America, they're still in power because it's way over there. They, they don't have, they're not even paying attention to what's going on in America. So in England, they passed something called the Sacramental Test Act. And that said, unless you're an Anglican Church of England minister, you're the only one that can preach anywhere. That meant any kind of Puritan churches are outlawed. Presbyterians, Puritans. This is when the Scots-Irish decided that uh, we're just going to hop on some ships and head for America because in Massachusetts, the Puritans still hold sway. And there are, actually, I've read the correspondence between this man, Cotton Mather, have you heard of him? He's famous for something else, um, the witchcraft. But he was con uh, corresponding with these uh, Presbyterians in Scotland, encouraging them to come. Come, brethren. You'll, you'll be welcome with open arms in so many words. And, and they thought that they were going to come and live with the Puritans in Boston in peace. They found out once they stepped on land that this was not going to be the case. Uh, they were told, yes, some of you can stay in Boston, but we want most of you to go out to live in Western Mass, Maine, and uh, New Hampshire. And if you read between the lines, they were putting them out there as a buffer between them and the Indians. So, and you've heard of Deerfield, the Deerfield Massacre. They're probably all Scots-Irish out there. <clears throat> there was, however, a small group that was able to form a congregation in Boston. And this is what the Puritans referred to their church as. The Church of the Presbyterian Strangers. <laughs> now, what does this mean? This means, yeah, you're, you're all Calvinists, but you're still Scottish. You're still Irish. So that, was, that, that bias is there, even with the Scots and the Irish. And by the way, this is uh, the, the location of this church was uh, where 100 Federal Street is today. And this is what's there today. Oh, I couldn't get the whole thing in. So I did this. Yeah, the State Street building. That congregation still exists in Boston. However, they have a different church, different location. It's uh, that beautiful church on the corner um, of the common there. And it's the first Congregationalist Church of Boston. And that's where their congregation is today. So we have the Scots-Irish too. But they've been shipped out to the, the hinterland. So it's mainly Irish Catholic in Boston. And we start seeing problems. <clears throat> the struggle begins, as I say. The anti-Catholic law of 1647. Now, what triggered this was rumors. There were rumors that there was a Jesuit priest skulking around Boston, hiding out in the woods in basements and holding mass. Huh. So they quickly passed this law. And I'll read it to you. This is the full extent of the law. Death to every and uh, all and every Jesuit seminary priest, missionary, or spiritual or ecclesiastical person made or ordained by the authority, power, jurisdiction, derived, challenged, or pretended from the Pope or See of Rome. <sighs> Translation, you can't have Catholic priests, you can't have masses, you can't practice your religion. If you get caught, you'll be put to death. So I wonder what they did. Maybe they were holding masses in basements out in the woods or just saying their prayers. I don't know. But for a long time, it was outlawed in Boston. I don't know if that's still in the books either. Here's another incident that happened in 1688. Now, Goodwife Glover, or Goody Glover, Goodwife was the way they would address people like Mrs. and Mr. today. 
and she was one of these indentured servants brought over to the West Indies. She and her husband, her husband didn't survive, and the story is that he wouldn't give up his religion, that's why he was put to death. Somehow, we don't know how she got up to New England, and by this time, she's in her 60s, and she has two daughters who are young adults, and they work for John Goodwin, a Puritan. He lived in the North End. This is a picture of his house, kind of like the Paul Revere house. Now, uh, Goodwin, uh, his daughters got in a bit of a row with uh, Goody Glover's daughters, and Goody Glover's daughters were accused of stealing the laundry, and a little argument broke out. Somehow, Goody Glover wasn't there, but she found out about it, and pretty soon, it's her, her daughters, screaming at John Goodwin's daughters, and from what I take it, Goody Glover had a pretty sharp tongue. She was very acerbic. She could really uh, take somebody down just by her wit and her tongue. And she did this to these two girls. They couldn't argue with her because she was so quick and sharp. And what they did, does this sound familiar? They fell down and started having seizures and saying Goody Glover was putting a spell on them. Sound familiar? This is the template for, for Salem. Pretty soon, Goody Glover was taken to the magistrates, and she was accused of being a witch. Now, they had this little manual here that you could read. It told you all the things you could do to identify a witch. And there were different phases. Uh, the first one was you would ask the accused witch to recite the Lord's Prayer. Sounds easy enough, if, uh, but if you're in league with the devil, you cannot do it, right? So Goody Glover recited the Lord's Prayer the best she knew in Latin. Uh-uh. Technically, she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it in English. And what's more, she started using that acerbic tongue against the magistrates, giving them... Uh, they referred to her as haughty. For that, for not being able to recite the Lord's Prayer in English, uh, talking back to the magistrates and being Irish, she was hanged. And I've read different other Puritans who were witness to this, and they all said, this, this is a bunch of bunk. Uh, she wasn't a witch. They did it because she was Irish. She had a big mouth and uh, she couldn't say it in English. And here's the treatment that she got. She's brought out and hanged on common land. Now, a lot of people make this mistake. They think uh, everybody was executed on Boston Common. Actually, common land was the neck. Remember I showed you Shamit, that little neck? That's Washington Street. And if you go down to Washington Street today, there's actually a, a bar called The Gallows because that's where the gallows was. It was the gates to Boston, and that's where they hang people. That's where she was hanged. And believe it or not, I was in the North End several years ago, and I came across an Irish restaurant. You believe that? <laughs> Irish aren't known for their food. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I noticed. I, I go there because I want to eat the Italian food. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's called Goody Glover's. It's no longer there, by the way. I think it lasted about a year. Anyway, they had this plaque outside, which, which I thought was kind of neat because it referred to her as the, the first Irish martyr in Boston. And it also had um, a little mural of what she might have looked like. I don't know. What do you think? She looks too nice. <laughs> So these, this is the Boston that our, our ancestors were brought into and the treatment that they got. Let's go back to England, shall we? Did you know that England has a holiday much like our 4th of July? It's celebrated on November 5th. And it's all because of this gunpowder plot that happened in 1605. And you're probably saying, why do they celebrate a gunpowder plot? The gunpowder plot was a group of Catholics in London who had secreted barrels of gunpowder into the cellar of Parliament. And they were waiting for a full session of Parliament with the King present. 
and they were going to blow it sky high. Why would they celebrate this? Because the plot was foiled. It's called Guy Fawkes Day because this is Guy Fawkes. He was supposed to guard the powder, but he, I don't know, maybe he made too much noise down there. He got caught, and they captured him, secured the powder, and then they brought him here. That's the Tower of London. And you know what they do to people in the Tower of London. Uh, within hours, he gave up all the names of the people that were involved in this plot. They were all dragged into court. Here they are. This is from the time. <clears throat> and they were put on trial and quickly convicted of treason. And they were all sentenced to most heinous punishment you can imagine. You didn't want to commit treason in England back then because the sentence was, you've heard this, to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Now, it depends on what you mean by drawn. Drawn could be being dragged to the gallows, or drawn could be another thing that I'm going to show you here. Uh, you'd be dragged to the gallows. These guys are lucky. They had mats. Usually, you were dragged on your stomach. Then you would be strung up on the gallows, choking and gagging, and then they cut you down at the last second. You're gasping for air. And then they would tie you to a table, slit you from stem to stern, open your innards, pull out your intestines. A lot of the times, people would still be conscious while this is going on. Oh, I know. Oof. Gets better. Then you'd be quartered. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. What I mean. Quartered. And then your head would be put on a pike and put on London Bridge as a warning to anybody that would commit treason. Now, you're probably like, what does this have to do with Boston? I'm not being gratuitous. Not really. Uh, this, this holiday translated over to Boston, but they didn't call it Guy Fawkes Day. They celebrated it as Pope's Day. And this is, this is a nice little thing they did. They would, uh, each neighborhood in Boston would create an effigy of the Pope. And the, the thing was, it was a competition. You would drag your effigy into the other neighborhoods, and they would try to tear it apart the best they could. You'd try to defend it. And by the end of the day, the neighborhood that had the effigy that was most intact won the day. And there was a lot of drinking and carousing. So that, that was going on in Boston. Up until the Revolutionary War, they were doing this. And you know who put a stop to it? He's on the quarter. I'll give you a hint. George Washington. Just after evacuation day, just after they had cleared the British out, they did their little Pope's Day. And he was totally and utterly appalled at this. He knew that a lot of the men in his army were Irish, they were Catholic, and they were fighting for this country. They were fighting against this actual thing here, this uh, intolerance of religion. And if you think about it, um, Boston wouldn't have been freed. Do you know who brought those cannons down from Fort Ticonderoga? A guy named Henry Knox, who was a Scots-Irishman. So that was the end of Pope's Day. And then finally, as the years go on, things start to cool out a little bit. And the Irish start to emerge. I'm going to tell you about some Irish firsts here, Irish Catholic firsts. The first mass in Boston was held right here. This is School Street. This is Washington. If you've ever been here, that's where the Irish Famine Memorial is. There was a little uh, wooden building that had been abandoned by the Huguenots. And the Catholics took it over and they held their first mass, 1788. Uh, first mass in New England. And they, nobody got killed. The first cathedral in Boston, 1803. This was over in Franklin Street. And there is a marker if you want to visit it. And by this time, we have some French. In, in Boston, and they are Catholics too, as you can see the names up there. Uh, this is the building that it's on. This was once owned by the Archdiocese. I believe St. John's Seminary owned it. Uh, they had to sell it. 
and now it's a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> True. Uh, the first burial ground in Boston uh, was first built in 1818. It took them that long, and I've seen, they tried to get burial grounds way before this, and the city of Boston kept turning them down. They didn't want the Irish to be buried in Boston. Actually, at the time they built this, South Boston was kind of an outlying place, like farm. And this is St. Augustine's, which begs the question, if you're Irish and Catholic, you know you need to be buried in consecrated ground. And they found uh, Catholic burials. This was when they dug up a street by the artifacts, you know, the crosses, whatnot. Uh, what did they do? My, my theory is that they had the burial. You probably had a priest, and he put some holy water on the ground. What more could you do? But it was until 1818 that they were allowed to have a cemetery. The first um, Irish Catholic paper, the pilot, still in existence. And now, if you go out in the street today, I think, and you just ask anybody, the man on the street, so when did the Irish first really start coming to America? They'd probably say, hmm, had something to do with a potato. <laughs> something to do with a potato, yeah, mm, the potato famine. This is more educated people to tell you. Now, that's why there was a deluge of people that came in from Ireland. But it actually started earlier. It started more of a trickle. And it was in the 1820s when we started seeing more Irish appearing in Boston. And it's because of these laws that were passed by Great Britain against Ireland. And if you look at these, I'm not going to read them all. They're basically stripping all of the human rights away from the Irish people. Like, you can't even educate your own child. You can't homeschool, because the, all the schools are Protestant. Uh, you can't attend Catholic worship. You can't hold a profession. Can't vote. Can't buy land. All these things were put into place. And on top of that, they did this. And these, this is just an amalgam of different laws. The Enclosure Acts. Uh, if you still owned land and uh, the British hadn't taken it from you in one way or another, um, you couldn't cultivate it, you couldn't farm it, you couldn't even fish on it. If you had trees on it, you couldn't harvest the trees. Uh, I wonder if they allowed you to mow the lawn. I don't know. You couldn't do anything with the land. There was one thing you could do with it, though. Sell it to an Englishman. And a lot of people did that, and it got out and they came to America. Now these people had money. And here, you can see in Boston, you can see the influx of Irish. Starting, here's our baseline, 2000 in the year 1820. 5,000 and five years later, and then 7,000 by 1830. And to give you some context, there was only 61,392 people in Boston at the time. So now the population is growing. It's bigger. You've got more Irish on top of the generations that have already been there. And we start to see conflicts. Now, now we're not talking about the, the uh, Puritans anymore. We're talking about their descendants, which are variously referred to as the Yankees or the Brahmins up on Beacon Hill. And we start seeing problems here. Now this is, this is something that happened in 1834. This is Mount St. Benedict, and, and there was an Ursuline convent. It's in Charlestown uh, today, Somerville. And it was a private school. And the students that went there were from the Brahmin class. The Yankees went to this Catholic school because their parents knew they could get a first-rate education here. Odd. And then things, there was a series of events here that ended up in a, a um, regrettable event. Let's start at the beginning here. This is Rebecca Reed. She was a Yankee of Yankee stock, but I guess wasn't the moneyed Yankee stock. She was allowed to go to the convent to go to school there on a scholarship. <clears throat> From all the reports we get, she loved it there. 
she was actually considering converting to Catholicism, and she wanted to be a nun. She wanted to be a novice. That's a, like a nun in practice. And then she abruptly left, and a few months later, this book comes up. Six months in a convent. In this book, it details horrible tortures that the nuns were committing on the students, um, that they were being chained in the basement, horrible punishments. Uh, they were being inculcated into the Catholic Church or brainwashed to be Catholics. All these horrible things. The thing was, none of it was true. It was all just her imagination. And people started reading this and clucking, what's going on in this convent? There was this paranoia about convents, what goes on in convents. And then this happened. This is another incident that happened. This is Sister Mary St. John. She was a music teacher at the convent. And one day in August, I guess they had school in August back then, she had some kind of problem with her class. I don't know what it was. And she got really frustrated, threw down her baton, and walked out the door. Now, I can understand that. I was a teacher, eighth grade. <laughs> And she ended up in the parlor of this Brahmin family down in Charlestown, invented, vented, vented. And the next thing you know, the, the mother superior comes. Uh, and she, I think Sister Mary St. George, George thought she was, uh, I'm sorry, I flipped over here. Sister Mary St. John thought that she was going to be fired or something. I don't know if nuns can be fired. But the Mother Superior, you just saw a slide of her, Sister Mary St. George, came and sat down and said, it's OK, darling. We all get frustrated sometime. And she was like, yeah, I'm sorry. And why don't you come back? So they went back. Everything was forgiven. No big deal. She had a little breakdown. The word on the street was that they dragged her back, kicking and screaming and that she's probably chained in the basement someplace. So this is getting out into the public. Uh, again, it adds more fuel to the fire. And then this guy shows up. Uh, actually, not, I'm ahead of myself a little bit. Um, this is Sister Mary St. George. All this got out into the public uh, venue. And uh, the selectmen decided to investigate. And they went up and they knocked on the door. And they demanded to inspect the convent. Now, Sister Mary St. George, was he just, she was another toughie. She basically stuck her head out the window here and told them where to go. And pretty soon, they were in the office of the bishop. And uh, he was a politician, obviously. If you're a bishop, you're a politician. And he went and he said, open the doors. Let them in. We've got nothing to hide. So she let this board of selectmen in. They went around. They took the girls and separately and talked to them. How do you like it here? And the girls, lo I love my teachers. I love what I'm learning. Is anybody being chained in the basement? No. Can we see the basement? No chains. Uh, all, this, all this stuff was baloney. And you know what they did? They left and did nothing. So people are still talking. They didn't make an announcement. Forget about the convent. Everything's fine and dandy. You know, stop worrying. And then uh, this man showed up. This is Reverend Lyman Beecher, father of Harriet Beecher Stowe and Her Henry Ward Beecher. He was a rabid anti-Catholic Protestant minister. He even wrote a book about how to get rid of the Catholics, basically. And he came to town, and he made three fiery sermons. Fiery, no pun intended. He actually advocated the burning of the cathedral in Boston. So this inflamed people even more. And then before you knew it, there was a massive crowd outside of the convent. And I'm sure there was alcohol involved, because it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, was, it started to get nighttime. And then they moved to the door. And they started shouting things like, let her go. I think they still thought they had the nun in chains. And then they kicked down the door, entered the convent. The, the students and the nuns went out the back door. They were hiding in the garden cemetery where uh, there were, had been nuns that passed away. And they went looting. They went on a looting spree. 
going through the nun's cells, tearing apart their clothing, uh, went into the church, stole all the gold. One man actually stole the host, put it in his pocket, and after all this was done, he was in a bar later on dancing around with the host. And this went on for a little bit. And here's another view of the convent. And then fin finally, somebody, somebody lit a match. And the whole place went up in flames. And the fire department came and watched it burn down. They, they really couldn't do anything by the time they got there. Now in the morning, Boston awoke. And across the Charles River is this smoldering building on the hill. Once the mayor found out about it, he was appalled. The governor was appalled. And they had heard murmurings that the same crowd was going to reconvene in a night or two and go after the cathedral. So they, they called out the militia. They, they sentried them around the cathedral, bayonets on. And what do you know, the mob did form once again. It started marching towards Franklin Street. They got around the corner and they were met with bayonets. I guess they weren't that brave. They turned right around and they decided to go pick over the remnants of the, the convent. Nothing much was left, so they decided to go out into the cemetery where you had these nuns buried. But they weren't buried. They were in these cement enclosures where you could just lift the lid off and get into the casket. So they removed that and they got into the caskets and they started pulling the gold fillings out of these dead nuns' teeth. This is the Boston that the Irish came to. And if you go there today, there's, there's a little plaque outside the Somerville Library. If you go about 100 yards down the street, you'll find the location. The, hill, the mount is no longer there. It's been leveled. But this is the neighborhood. And right about where that house is, I think, is where the, the convent was. And I've walked down these streets before. I look up in the windows and I think, I wonder if these people know anything about what happened here in the 1830s. There's nothing really to remind you. The street name, that's about it. It's gone. And this is a good one. The Broad Street Riot. Now, Broad Street, if you go to Boston today, is the financial district of Boston. It's all skyscrapers. Back then, it was an Irish ghetto. It was wooden tenements, a few brick buildings. You have to look very closely to find what I call witness buildings. If you know brickwork, you can tell the old buildings. This is definitely a building that was there in 1834, 1835. <coughs> now, what happened <coughs> was that there was a, a group of Irish coming back from a wake. Is it true what they say about Irish wakes? Oh, you know it. Oh, you know it. <laughs> and there was a, a, a Yankee fire company coming back from a fire. These two groups were passing. Somebody said something to somebody, and a huge melee broke out. First, it was these two groups. Next, it's all, all the buildings emptied into the street start fighting. Word goes out to the Yankee neighborhoods. They start flooding. Three days of battling in the streets of Boston, picking up whatever they could get their hands on and bashing each other. By the time it was over, all the, all the apartments on this street were looted, furniture burned. And the funny thing is, nobody got killed. Three days of riots. They all got hauled in, all of them, Yankee, Irish, the only ones that went to jail were the Irish, though. And interesting how they were depicted back then. Here's the Irish, monkey-like. So it's already there. Boston, that's Boston. They're about to experience the deluge, as I call it. And it all happened because of the potato famine. Now, when I was a kid, I'd always wonder, um, I knew about the potato famine, but I thought, why, why did the Irish just eat potatoes? Why didn't they eat other stuff? And the answer is pretty simple. At this point, they were tenant farmers. They were working the English farms up there, probably on the land of their ancestors, which had everything. They, they had livestock. They had vegetables, 
wheat, corn, you name it. And it was being shipped out. And the potato is a marvelous thing because you can put it in a little enclosure like this. And this, this is Ireland today. You can see, see all those little boxes? There were little cottages in each one of them at one point. And it grows deep and you can live a year off that one crop. And it's amazing. I've looked at the recipes, what the Irish did with potatoes. They cooked it every way you could possibly think because they had to eat it for the whole year with not much else, milk maybe. And that crop failed and they started to starve. Now initially, there was a, a sympathetic government in charge over in Great Britain and they tried to help. They built soup kitchens. <coughs> they made workhouses. They did all sorts of things to try to help. Didn't help a lot, but it, it was some help. And then there was a switch in government. A more conservative government came in under Lord John Russell. Now, they had a laissez-faire attitude. Their, their um, way of thinking was that let the economy, the free market, straighten itself out. Just leave it alone. Laissez-faire means leave it alone and the free market will correct itself. And on top of this, they blame the Irish for it too. So they pulled back all these resources, the soup kitchens and everything, and just started to let people starve. And they passed this nice little law here. Uh, Great Britain basically said, it's not our responsibility. Uh, you landlords who are in, you know, you're on the ground, you take care of it. And this is how the landlords took care of it. Oh, you're too weak to work on my farm? Well, I'm going to evict you from your cottage. And there were mass evicted, evictions. There were people just thrown out into the street, and they had to find anywhere they could. They built these little things called skibberines out in the woods and ferreted through the dirt like these two people here, looking for food. Now, these illustrations that you're seeing right here were done from life. Reporters who were from England were doing these and they were in the papers. People were reading about it in England. They knew about it. They knew the situation. And meanwhile, this crop's being shipped out. I got to give the Brahmins in Boston credit because they actually put together a rescue ship called the Jamestown, full of food, sent it to Ireland. So just take a look at these. The, the pictures speak for themselves. This is shocking. Is that woman alive? Is that baby suckling off a dead woman? What's the father doing? He's going to get bark from a tree. <clears throat> Maybe you can boil it and eat it. The son's already chewing on his shoe leather. Didn't even bother to boil it. And I don't, he looks like he's uh, halfway gone. And these are all pictures done from life. If they had photography in the they did have photography in the 1840s, but it was pretty primitive. And people started dying in the thousands. In the end, about two million people immigrated out. This was the answer. Uh, the uh, population dropped by 25%. The population has never regained those numbers since. So the answer is we some of the landlords pay for uh, passage to America. Some of the people were able to scrape together the, mo the money to go. And those left behind probably starved. Or some of them survived. This is a statuary that's in Dublin. This is what they looked like when they got on those ships. They're already emaciated. They're already diseased. And they get put onto these ships, these rickety old wooden ships that was the cheapest passage you could get. And they were aptly named coffin ships. Can you imagine a two or three month passage in that? You've got people that have dysentery, cholera, typhoid. <clears throat> and can you imagine the stench? And I see these pictures, um, especially this one here. And I have flashbacks to when I used to teach about the Middle Passage with the slave trade. Obviously, that was much more horrendous. They were chained and tight packed, loose packed. But it was the same result. Every morning, they'd clean out the hull, 
pick up the dead bodies and throw them over, overboard, just like with the slavery. And can you imagine the joy in their heart when they finally sighted land? Here it is. Here's America, the land of opportunity. The streets are paved in gold, right? That wasn't, that's not a cliche. Some people actually believe that stuff. And they got here, and it was a much different story. Uh, they, they landed in the cities, and they stayed in the cities for some reason. These were all farmers. Some of them went out to the countryside, but a lot of them just stayed in the cities. And sometimes they had family to welcome them, but more often than not, you were just dumped. That's it. You're, you're in New York. And welcome to the five points, probably the worst ghetto in the world. Uh, Charles Dickens went on a tour here, and he said it was worse than Calcutta, just teeming with poor Irish people. Um, the swells up on the Upper East Side would come down and tour the area. This is where the term slumming comes from, to see the Irish. <coughs> And it probably wasn't much better here in Boston. And we have this statue in Boston. It shows how they arrived. Now, the artist says this is the family a few years later, after they've been in America, and they're looking much better. When I first saw the statue, I thought, this is the modern American family. They're looking back at where their family came from, their, their roots. That's what's great about art. You can interpret it however you want. But when they got here, they found out um, conditions weren't that great. Here's housing. This is a, a photograph from the air, from a hot air balloon in 1860. Gives you an idea of what Boston looked like, even in the 1840s, probably similar. <clears throat> now, the Irish settled their families into what became these Irish ghettos. The Boston waterfront, the Battery March, which I don't even think uh, exists anymore, Broad Street. The North End. Next time you're in the North End uh, at Strega or one of those Italian restaurants, look at the tops of the buildings, and they've all got Irish names. The Irish built those buildings. East Boston was all Irish. South Boston was farmland. It, it wasn't until later that people started moving out there. The South End eventually would be an Irish ghetto. And there was no room already. So they were shoved into sheds, barns, stables, basements, uh, un under the most unsanitary conditions. And uh, I, have, I have some statistics here. One survey showed 67 toilets in 118 houses inhabited by 540 immigrants. 17 of those were out of order. One sink might serve a whole stinking tenement. So if you want to get washed, you better stand in line. One outhouse, a whole neighborhood. Can you imagine that? One toilet for your whole neighborhood? And they were outside. They didn't have running water. So these are the places that they, they had to live in. But I guess it was better than starving. You know, um, I love doing this. Uh, my wife always says, he's always saying what was there once. When we were in the North End walking around, I stopped and I looked at that alley and I was like, this gentrified neighborhood where you pay an arm and a leg to live in now? Looked like that, I'm sure. Teeming with Irish. And people, there were probably three or four families in one of those apartments that one person lives in now. And now this is probably what Hanover Street looked like. Much different city at the time. I look at these streets and I think of scenes like this. Now, what was available for work? As I said, these people were farmers. They didn't know much else. If you were a woman, uh, you had two choices. You could be a domestic, a maid, or you could be a washerwoman. They spent all day on their hands and knees scrubbing the floors of the Brahmins up on Beacon Hill and around. If you're a man, you had some choices. You could be a waiter. 
Uh, I found my research uncovered that you, you couldn't be a barber because the African Americans had the corner on the barber market. They had it all tied up. Uh, you could work in a grocery store, modern day equivalent of 7-Eleven. These are the jobs that were available. Or if this factory didn't have one of those signs outside that said no Irish need apply, you could work in one of these beautiful sweatshops. Six days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day, you didn't move from that machine because you're doing piecework. You stop working, you lose money. It was all cash payment. And it was freezing in the winter and boiling hot in the summer, but it was better than starving. And this is uh, what Boston looked like at the time. This is before the EPA came in, I guess. Yeah. There were other jobs. You could be a longshoreman or a stevedore. And you know, today they had those big cranes that they put the containers on the ship with. Uh, it was barrels back then, and they went on the backs of Irishmen up into the ships. And there's the waterfront as it appeared back then. And here it is today. <coughs> or the quintessential ditch digger. Muck legs, black legs. And many of the men did labor like this. And a lot of these guys died before they were 50. This is one thing, a common thing through some of the politicians I'm going to talk about. All their fathers died young. Here's, here's another shot, literally digging a ditch. This is taken on Park Street in Boston. Hard labor. And you know what? Boston was built by the Irish, and I'm going to show you how. It started with Beacon Hill. They removed Beacon Hill. By then, it was just picks and hand carts and shovels. And why did they do that? Because they were going to fill in the marshy areas of Boston. Here's a map showing what the Irish did. That's what the Puritans left them. Here's what they did to it. That was Beacon Hill. That filled in that area. And then they started digging dirt all around. And they started to fill in these areas. You're starting to see the modern Boston appear. I was once in Chinatown, and I looked at the street sign and said, Beach Street. And I thought, there's no beach near here. Because <laughs> at one time, it did go to the beach. And also, the West Cove. And yes, the Back Bay. And by this time, they did have steam shovels. But you know who was operating the steam shovels? It was the Irish. That's what the Irish built. And as you can imagine, there was a terrific backlash, this deluge of Irish. Uh, my research uncovered, I think, uh, of all the years of the famine, one year, I think it was 1846 or 47, 80,000 Irish came into Boston alone. That's not even counting all the other years. 80,000. And there formed a new political party based on hatred of the Irish, hatred of the Catholic. It was called the Know Nothing Party. It started as a secret society at first. They were called the Know Nothings. They kept no records. It was all secret. And they were called the Know Nothings because if one of them came out of the meeting and somebody said, hey, what went on in there? They, they were told, I know nothing. Kind of like Sergeant Schultz. They morphed into what was called the, the Native American Party. And uh, this is basically their platform. This is what they're opposed to. Papal aggression. Roman Catholicism, foreigners holding office, raising foreign military companies. They had Irish companies, militia. They disbanded them eventually. Uh, being taxed for the support of foreign paupers. Uh, secret foreign orders like the AOH or something. The funny thing is, the funny thing about this group, and this party would disintegrate within 10 years, was that they were for the abolition of slavery. And the, when they finally disintegrated, that abolitionist ring, wing eventually joined up with another party called the Republicans, the Lincoln Republicans. So I guess the, the good thing comes out of everything. And so. In, uh, in the 1850s, 
they, they swept the elections. Uh, 1854, they swept the state constitutional offices. They got every state constitutional office, including the governor. Listen to this. They won all 40 state Senate races, carried every U.S. constitutional district. Out of 381 seats up for election in the State House of Reps, they got 379. That couldn't be done today with our political division. They took over, and luckily they disintegrated very quickly, but they took over Massachusetts. Even the governor of Massachusetts was one of the know-nothings. Here's our first know-nothing governor. I'd like to say it was our last, but no. Uh, Henry J. Gardner, and he ran on a platform of addressing this issue of this influx of immigrants from Ireland. And this is their, their political agenda. What they did, once they got into office, they passed a law saying only the reading of the King James Bible would al be allowed in public schools. Uh, they banned teaching of all foreign languages. They disbanded the Irish militia, militia units. Now they proposed a constitutional amendment to the Massachusetts Constitution that would have forbade Roman Catholics from holding public office in Massachusetts. It failed by one vote. And they had something called the Pauper Removal Act, whereby they scooped up 1,300 Irish paupers in asylums and shipped them back to Ireland. And they also had something else, which I find a little comical. They had the committee, the Joint Legislative Committee for the Inspection of Nunneries and Convents. And here's a cartoon showing them in investigating a nun's room or her cell. Oh, what have they found? A rosary. Oh, could this be an incendiary device? Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's a chamber pot, or as they call it, some of them called it back then, the thunder jug. Yeah, so luckily by 1858, they, they had faded away, except for that abolitionist wing. But this was enough for the Irish. They started to get, this stuff started to get under their skin. And I'm gonna show you what the tenor of the times was. This, these are taken from the newspapers of America, not just Boston. Here's the poor house from Galway, send it back. I love this one. You have to look at it closely. Those are not alligators. Those are bishops in miter hats, invading America, oh, yeah. threatening those innocent Native Americans coming from that evil domain in Rome. And here's a nice one. This, uh, this, is, this is tame compared to what I'm going to show you. This is, uh, I've read it over and over and over again. This is what they considered <clears throat> a clean Irishman. He's got a nice tie. He's clean. You can work with him. Uh, more often than not, they were depicted like this. Ape-like. Always ape-like. Um, if you notice here, some other things, he's not working. He's just laying around doing nothing. I mean, we know that wasn't true. Um, drinkers, alcohol. And what are they living in? A shanty. Have you heard of the shanty Irish? Shanty Irish. And also the fighting Irish. All they do is brawl and fight. Still hear that today. And oh, if the Irish get involved in politics, you know who's going to be pulling the strings, right? The Catholic Church is going to be pulling the strings, telling them what to do. I think they were saying this up until 1960. And there's another group here who they didn't like either, the Chinese. And, and this is little, right in the pages of our newspapers, open bigotry and racism. I like this one. Who would you rather have for your nurse? Florence Nightingale or Bridget McBrowser? <laughs> and here's Lady Liberty grabbing that dirty Irishman. Hmm, that's what America thought about the Irish. A book just came out recently. It said, when America hated the Irish. And the Irish started to organize politically and this is the beginning of the end for the power of the Brahmins. This is the beginning of ward politics here. 
It started with this guy, Patrick McGuire. He started a little club called the Young Men's Democratic Society. And what they did was any Irish that needed a job, needed housing, even food, you went to his club and he'd help you out. He also was the first one to start to encourage the Irish to get government jobs. Even if it's lamplighter, dog catcher, eventually it was policemen. Eventually they became aldermen, which would be like the city council today. And then we got our first Irish Catholic mayor of Boston, Hugh O'Brien, 1885. Now, I call this the age of cooperation because they were actually working. Uh, it was like a coalition between the liberal Brahmins up on the hill and, and the Irish. And this one, too, he was referred to even in the newspapers. He's a clean Irishman. You can do business with him. And then eventually we had the third Irish Catholic mayor, Patrick Collins. So the, the uh, Irish are becoming powerful here. And it's through this ward politics. And if you talk about ward politics in Boston, you can't talk about it without talking about this man, Martin Lemansny. He was so powerful, they called him the Boston Mahatma. And he had his club over on the west end of Boston. It was called the Hendricks Club. And he was the best. If you needed anything, jobs, housing, even money, they, they had insurance, uh, you went to Lemansny. And it was all free, except for one thing. You voted the way he wanted you to. He said you voted for candidate X, the whole west side would vote for candidate X. That was the power. And he had uh, some protégés that kind of studied at his knee, I like to say. Here's one. His name was John Fitzgerald, Johnny Fitz. He would eventually become the so-called ward boss of the North End. Now, here's a funny story. Uh, when he was first getting into politics, he was first coming to prominence, uh, he was talking to some of his men on the street. And I guess there was a reporter hiding in the shadows, trying to write down, trying to overhear what they were saying. And he kept, kept hearing what he thought was, honey fits, honey fits, honey fits. They were saying Johnny fits. And the name stuck. He wrote his article out about Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. And now forever and all, he's known as Honey Fitz. And over in the east of uh, Boston was P.J. Kennedy. He owned a few saloons. Same thing. You came to him when you needed anything. And he controlled the voting over there. Eventually, he would be a state representative. And then a little later came this guy, James Michael Curley. He's another one. They, he would uh, come to prominence in the south end of Boston. I believe all of these guys, their fathers died young. That's what I was referring to either, also. I'm going to tell you about each of them, just a little story about each of them. Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. And you can see the writing on the wall, right? Fitzgerald Kennedy, right? That's where Rose Fitzgerald was born. Four Garden Court right off of North Square in a tenement building. Now, when we think of the Kennedys, we think of Hyannis and Palm Beach. and No, that's where they started, right here. His father died at a young age. He had to take over, be the man of the family and take over. I think they, he had six brothers and sisters. Even doing that, he found the time to get into political organizations. He eventually was the assistant to the boss in Boston, the, the North End. And he eventually became the ward boss in the North End. And this is where he lived. This, this uh, humble residence. And this is the front door. I, I like to say I don't think it's been painted since he lived there. And then P.J. Kennedy over in East Boston, this is what he looked like years later, was a powerhouse in himself. And this is when both of them became friendly and the families would go to Old Orchard Beach and have vacations. Let me point out a few people here. Here's P.J. Kennedy. There's Honey Fitz. Joe Kennedy, Rose Kennedy, and the rest is history, right? And talking about history, here's P.J. Kennedy in his elder years with his grandson there on the left. You might recognize him. 
Now, James Michael Curley was a whole other bowl of wax. Uh, he lived on Hamden Street. To give you, uh, today it's called Boston University Hospital. Back then it was uh, City Hospital. And he lived in back of the hospital. I found the address where the tenement was. Sadly, it was torn down, but you can see it was right next to this building here. So he lived in a building like this. His father was one of those ditch diggers I talked about. He was a big man. And on the job, the other men would, would uh, kind of tease him into picking up the, the, the largest thing that he could pick up to show his strength. One day they were on the job and there was a big boulder over there. So, hey, go pick up the boulder. So he went over, picked up the boulder, had a brain aneurysm, and dropped dead on sight. So James Michael Curley, his mother, and his brother were left without a father. He had to take on the role of man of the house. He dropped out of eighth grade and got a job working as a drug clerk or a runner. Of, he basically delivered the drugs from the pharmacy. And one day, one of, the, uh, one of the patrons said, Jimmy, you've got the gift of gab. You should be a politician. And I guess he took it to heart because uh, before he knew it, he became a city councilman. Had his own club, his own uh, place over on Ham Hamden Street here. It was called the Tammany Club of all things. And he was almost as good as, he was better than Lamansney. If you needed a job, you needed food, you needed housing, you went to Curly. This is what got him into trouble, though. One of his constituents came to him one day, and he said, Oh, James Michael, I flunked the postal exam. And Curly said, Well, how come? I couldn't spell Constantinople. Well, we'll fix that for you. And it appears that there was another constituent that did the same thing, because Curly and his brother both went in under the assumed names of these two gentlemen, took the test for them, and got caught. He got put into jail. And you would, would that be the end of James Michael Curley? It was the best thing that ever happened to him. Yeah, he, he's not. he was. Elected mayor four times, he was elected governor, he was in Congress two times. Every time he ran for election, it had come up. Didn't you commit fraud? Didn't you end up in jail? And he'd say the same thing. I did it for a friend. And that would solidify his persona with that constituency because they knew he was willing to stick out his neck to the point of going to jail. I'll tell you more about him later. That's his little club there, or the, what it, where it was. Yeah. So, this is Mayor Collins. I'll, I'll give you a blow up here. He died midway in office. Now, Martin Lemansky, he had the next candidate all lined up, ready to go. He had him in the pipeline. Thing was, uh, young Honey Fitz over in the North End wanted to be mayor. Oh, he went against the machine. This is his club, Chandler Street, the Jefferson Club. It's still there, that building. So he ran against the machine. He ran against the age of cooperation, the Brahmins and the Irish. He turned the tables. He started saying, all of our problems, you Irish people, it's due to them, the Brahmins, the, the English, the Puritans. And that had more traction than anything Lemansney was doing. And he got elected third Irish mayor in Boston. Now, he, wrote, he ran on this ticket of bigger, better, busier, and he did that. He brought business in, into Boston. They built. He was a great mayor. But you've got the Brahmins now are on the sidelines, and they're not happy about it. They formed a, a, a committee called the Good Government Committee. Curly liked to call them the Goo Goos. <laughs> uh, and they attacked him. They said, he's taking bribes. He's handing out jobs doing all these shady things. He was still the ward boss. He was handing out jobs. I doubt the bribery, though. He didn't get elected the next time. He spent one term out of office and got elected a second time. But man, I think he loved that job. And this is where he was the mayor of Boston. Did you know they wanted to tear that down? School Street. Yeah, School Street. I think there's a Ruth Chris Steakhouse in there now. It's the old city hall. 
and they replaced it with oh, 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 that wasteland and that upside down cake. Do you know what this type of architecture is called? Brutalist. Brutalist. It's <laughs> aptly named. And if you go to the Soviet Union, they're loaded with those things. Oh, sorry, little uh, editorializing now. <clears throat> so, back to Honey Fitz. He loved the job. Uh, it started in, in the North End whenever he saw his constituents. He would call them, my dearos. And when he became mayor, everybody in Boston was one of his dearos. So in, in the streets, he'd, he'd call out, my dearos. And look at the smile on his face. He was like this energetic little pixie. He had the energy of, you know. And here he is in later years. Um, he retired down the Palm Beach. Here he is with Joe and Jack. <clears throat> and uh, I found a story. Ted Kennedy wrote this. Um, in the end, he, he said that Honey Fitz would just sit in lobbies of hotels down there. Doesn't that sound sad? But as soon as somebody came to the desk and went, ding, I'm from Boston, he'd jump out of his seat and say, my dearos! <laughs> and he'd probably get lunch on the house and give them the tour of Palm Beach. So that was Honey Fitz. And you know, here he is. I, I, I love that, the way he's always so happy. And I think he, he had his sense of humor Jack, it got passed down to Jack. Here's his gravestone. Died in 1950. And if you want to visit Honey Fitz, he's at St. Joseph's Cemetery in West Roxbury. You know, there's another memorial, or there was another memorial to him. The John Fitzgerald Expressway. How many people remember spending hours in traffic on this thing? I'm old enough. And as you know, it was replaced by that beautiful tunnel. And on top is, it is a beautiful open space, the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Now that brings us to the mayoral race of 1913, which pitted James Michael Curley against Honey Fitz. Now in the beginning straw polls, Honey Fitz was way, way, way ahead. And he was just some guy that spent time in jail or was a city councilor. He wasn't doing very well in the polls. What happened is very interesting. Now, Honey Fitz, as I said, he was a ball of energy, especially when the campaign was going on. If there was an Elks meeting, there was a Lion Club meeting, there was a Little League ball game, he'd show up and glad hand everybody, and, you know, vote for me, vote for me. I came across a story where there was a man, he was, his wake was being held, and in comes Honey Fitz and glad hands everybody and vote for me, he's out the door. And the wife was astounded. She said to the other people, I didn't know my husband knew him. He didn't. <laughs> that was Honey Fitz. Now, he'd have the, the, this very tough schedule. Every day he'd be doing this stuff. And at the end, every day of a hard day of campaigning, he would go to this roadhouse outside of Boston. Now, uh, he was known for going in bars and singing Sweet Adeline. They would request it. Honey Fitz, sing Sweet Adeline. And he was a teetotaler, too. Odd. Now, <laughs> in this roadhouse, he often, during the course of the night, he would have a little dance with this young cigarette girl whose name was Toodles Ryan. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was innocent. He'd just have a little dance. And one night, he give her a peck on the cheek. And the thing was, one of Curly's men was there. Word got back to Curly. And the next thing you know, Honey Fitz comes home. His wife is sitting on the steps with young Rose right next to her with an envelope in her hand, tapping it. It, it was like a, a Ricky Ricardo moment. You got some splaining to do. <laughs> Because what, what was in that envelope was like he was having an uh, adulterous affair on the dance floor or something. And he, he explained it. He, he said, this is Curly. He's a dirty player. He's trying to get me out of the election. It's not going to work. 
And you can imagine Curly. Curly's sitting back, waiting for the newspaper, waiting for that headline, Honey Fitz drops out. Didn't happen. So he went to plan B. He announced, Curly announced, I'm going on a lecture tour. Two lectures. One would be Great Lovers in History. Cleopatra to Toodles. <laughs> the other one was Great Libertines in History. Henry VIII till present. At this, Honey Fitz saw it. This is just going to get worse. My name's going to be dragged through the mud, and I'm not going to do this anymore. And he dropped out. I can imagine he probably made an announcement saying, I want to spend more time with my family. Isn't that what they all say? <laughs> so by default, James Michael Curley became the fourth mayor. And look at him there. Does he look like a gangster? Yeah. Now, this is, this is, we're coming to the end, folks. Um, this last section is called The Good, the Bad, and the Curly. <laughs> He was, he was bad, but he was also very good. He was like a contradiction. I want to tell you about the good Curly first. And he, the thing is, he, he was mayor four times, but it was every 10 years. It's like they found out how crooked he was, and he didn't get elected. Then after 10 years, they kind of forgot and elected him again. So and I love this one. Here he is, Curly. He got elected that first time, and... Uh, the first thing he did when he got elected was in the city hall, he made an uh, order. He said, um, I, I don't want the washerwoman to have to scrub the floor anymore. Give them mops. And you might be thinking, wow. Hmm. He gave those women dignity. He said no woman should be on her knees unless she's praying to God. Thing was, his mother was a washerwoman, so he could understand that. And there are other stories of him. Also, he was still the ward boss. He was giving out jobs. He was helping people. He built all sorts of public works projects throughout uh, Boston. And there, there's another story that comes down to us from his chauffeur. And he said often Curly would work late into the night, and he'd come out, and there'd be nobody there. And there were a lot of times there'd be this, this guy, Mike, who was a drunk, and he'd be staggering around the streets. And Curly would come out and he'd see him, and he'd you know, walk up with a saw buck in his hand, shake Mike's hand and say, here, Mike, here's the money I owe you. No cameras, no reporters, just that chauffeur. It didn't come out until after he died. So these are some good things that he did. He tried to help the poor. They were a major concern of him's. And here we see him. This, uh, I think, is in the early days. And we'll see Curly through the years here, eventually. Now, you want to talk about the bad Curly? This personifies the bad Curly. This is the mansion that he got when he was uh, elected mayor the first time. On, on his salary, he no way would have been able to afford this. And Editors started editorialing uh, against him, that he was crooked, that he was taking bribes. And the way he, that he solved that was that he'd sue them. What his answer to this was, was I have investments with a plumbing firm called Daly and Sons, oddly enough. You know, no relation. Now, he also had a violence streak, too. And there was this uh, editor, his name was Enright, and he persisted with his editorials that Curly was crooked. He's taking bribes. And he was. He was crooked as the day is long. This incident happened. Enright was out for lunch. He's walking down Washington Street. And here comes Curly, walking briskly towards him. And he walks up to Enright and smacks him in the mouth. <laughs> Enright later says, I came to on my back. Looked up, and there's James Michael Curley hurling invectives at me. Can you imagine Mayor Wu doing that? <laughs> or Marty? Or, or Menino? And he got away with it. He also did it once on air, on WBZ. There was a, a political surrogate uh, giving a, an interview before Curley was supposed to go on. Didn't know Curley was coming on next, and he was bad-mouthing Curley. 
During the interview, Curly went into the recording booth and pummeled him right there on the air. <laughs> and he got away with it. And there's all these examples of, of his corruption, his, his uh, double dealings. And here, here's one that perfectly exemplifies it. There was a roofer, came to Curly and said, hey, I need a job. That's not bad if he got a job. He looked through the books. He said, okay, there's a school over on the south end, and it needs a roof. I want you to put a bid in that's really high. <coughs> and the, the idea was he was going to skim the, the difference. And then the roofer says, oh, okay. And then he went up to look at the roof. He climbed up the ladder, and he's looking. There's nothing wrong with the roof. He must have the wrong school. So he went back to Curly. He said, there's nothing wrong with the roof. He's like, yeah, just go up there and make like you're busy. And you get paid. And this much goes back to me. Keep it on the down low. That was the crooked curly. It said that he had two safes full of cash. And here he is through the years. That's in the 20s. You can tell by the raccoon coat. 1930s. Tried to sidle up next to Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt found out what he was and distanced himself through the years. And then uh, his last term was in the 40s. Here we have it, during World War II. Now at this point, he's thinking, uh, I've got all this cash, and I've got to invest it someplace so I can have a good retirement. So he's looking around for investments, and he finds this group out in Nevada. And they say, we have a silver mine. Come on out and look at it. Little did he know, they were all con men. They had this tunnel, and they stuck little pieces of silver in the dirt. And Curly came in, and he's like, this is, this is a silver mine. I'm going to be rich. Put all of his money into it. And then the, these con men started peddling influence down in Washington using Curly's name and bribing people and all this stuff. And they got caught by the federal government. Curly got sucked into it. He was charged with mail fraud, fraud, sent to federal prison, Danbury Prison in Connecticut, and he's still the mayor. <laughs> now, every, every politician in New England sound, signed a petition to get James Michael out of jail, except for one. Uh, he was a young PT captain, new congressman from Massachusetts, karma. He did get out. He finished his term up as mayor and ran for a fifth term. He didn't get elected. I think he stole that from the guy that actually owned it. Uh, now, it's kind of a sad story here. He had lost all of his money. Actually, two of his kids died on the same day. And he began to think he was cursed for all the bad things he did. But he, he started going around the state house and trying to drum up jobs from some of the politicians. And I came across this story by Tip O'Neill. He, he must have been a representative at the time. And he approached Tip O'Neill. And uh, uh, Tip, can, can you do anything for me, any job that I can do? And Tip said, well, yes, you could raise some funds for me, get some new donors. How about that? <laughs> OK, I'll do that for you. And then these new donors started coming to Tip O'Neill and saying things like, I thought I gave you 20000 Where's the rest? <laughs> James Michael Curley at it again. Now, you'd think that that's kind of a sad way to go out. But something else happened. Something uh, that he went out with a bang, you might say. This book came out called The Last Hurrah. And it's a fictional account written by a local author, Edwin O'Connor, about Curley. But it's fiction. And the mayor in it is called Mayor Skeffington. People knew 100% it was all about Curly. All the events in it were Curly, 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 all the events. Now, O'Connor was a little uh, timid because he thought that Curly wouldn't appreciate this book. And you know how he, he treated Enright, right, the editor? He was afraid of running into Curly for this. So one day, O'Connor's coming down the State House steps, and he sees Curly get out of a car. And Curly starts making a beeline for him with his hand out like this. He gets to O'Connor and he shakes his hand. And he goes, I love the book. I love especially the part where I die. <laughs> and then, then he goes on a lecture tour 
referring to himself as Mayor Skeffington, <laughs> making money off this. What's more, this actually went to Hollywood and became a smash hit called The Last Hurrah, starring Spencer Tracy, another Irishman. Now, if you go to visit Mayor Curley, he's over at Mount Calvary Cemetery in Rosendale. That's my poor photography, so I, I got a better one here. It's like a resume. <laughs> yeah. Died in 58. Um, oh, by the way, he's just a, a few, few yards from John L. Sullivan. I think the, the title, of all these titles, the one that he cherished the most was this. Mayor of the Poor, yeah. And he was um, allowed to lay in state here on, in the rotunda of the State House, and I'm told the line went up and down Beacon Street as far as the eye could see. Many people love Curly, many people hated him. And I love this. This is the statuary over uh, by Quincy Market. And there's two Curlies, isn't that interesting? Now, now I say this is the bad Curly, this is the good Curly. Uh, and I used to bring my eighth graders over here on the Freedom Trail. And they'd come up and they'd rub his belly and sit in his <laughs> lap. And I'd say to him, do you know who that is? Nope. I'd say, look at that thing that's attached to your hand that you're always looking at. Look him up. That's James Michael Curley. All right. So in closing, I'd like to say that these people, the Irish, they came to our shores as servants, as prisoners, as half-dead, starving refugees. And they endured ethnic and religious persecution and bigotry. They endured squalid, wretched poverty. And they endured back-breaking, menial labor. But in the end, in the end, they overcame, they surmounted, and they prevailed. Thank you for coming out today.